that's usually my cue uh, to check my phone. Uh, and I usually stand up and I say something funny. And then I introduce tonight's great speaker. Well, I don't have anything funny to say, and we don't have a great speaker. But I, <laughs> I am uh, hopefully going to share some thoughts with you about uh, what I've seen happening in the last couple of years uh, in American foreign policy relative to Russia. And in particular, Russia's approach to uh, international, the international community. Uh, so um, I got a few slides I'm going to share with you. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. And I'll be happy to, to, to open up to some Q&A. Um, to begin with, you need to know that I'm a Cold War kid, which means that I was raised on a very steady diet of the three Bs, right? Bond, Boris, and Natasha. <laughs> and of course, the third B, you know who that is, right? Rocky Balboa. <laughs> what this means, though, is that I grew up in a culture that said the Soviets are the bad guys, the Russians are the bad guys, they're the evil empire. And so I'm aware of the fact that my conditioning as a child has prepared me to view the world through a certain lens. So after, uh, probably because of some of those, uh, some of those uh, cultural references and some nightmares about nuclear bombs falling in my backyard, I thought that my career was going to be spent looking at pictures like this. This is Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square. And in the Cold War, there were a whole class of analysts who, and there might be some in this room tonight, so I, if you're here, I salute you, uh, who would spend their careers looking at who was standing next to whom at the May Day parades to try to figure out what's happening with internal Soviet politics. And I thought that's what my career would be. So I went to college. I studied history and modern languages. I was prepared to spend my life uh, sort of thinking about who was standing on top of Lenin's tomb. Funny thing happened in the middle of my sophomore year, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. And so that career plan sort of got tossed out the window, but I carried on with my study of history. I went to Georgetown, got a PhD, wrote a dissertation about the American use of political warfare in the Cold War, and found that that was really not a great way to meet women. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the topic is very, very limited and not really all that interesting. Uh, it, and so I spent the next part of the next decade after I finished the PhD uh, working in Washington, uh, principally on defense issues, hard defense issues, end strength, nuclear security, the war on terror, and didn't give a lot of thought to the issues of political warfare that I had studied in graduate school. Not because they weren't important and interesting and I didn't learn something, but because, well, nobody cared. That's really the truth. Nobody cared. And that seemed to change at some point in the summer of 2016. Uh, and I, I can't quite pin, I was thinking about this. When, when was the moment that it's just sort of like my bat senses started tingling? Um, and I, I have a hard time pinning it down. But there was a moment when the DNC emails started leaking through WikiLeaks. And my head sort of cocked to one side. And I said, wait a minute, this seems familiar. The technology is new, but the method was very familiar. And so we started paying a little bit closer attention, reached out to some friends who were interested in these issues as well. And we wound up, I wound up writing a study, uh, an article, really based mostly on my dissertation uh, for War on the Rocks, which is a DC-based policy journal. Uh, that is uh, essentially all well, it says, the Russians read our Cold War playbook. And this was published in uh, November of 2016, just before Election Day. And it took a look at what the United States had tried to do in the uh, 1950s, in particular in the Eisenhower administration, and how some of the things that we were seeing emerge from Russia in the summer of 2016 aligned with what we were trying to do uh, in the 1950s. The dirty little secret is that the American playbook in the 1950s was actually the Soviet playbook in the 1930s. So it's a cycle that repeats itself. Uh, but the important thing was that there was a pattern that was already emerging. So tonight, I'm not going to talk to you about Donald Trump. I'm not going to talk to you about Robert Mueller. What I'm interested in is the use of political warfare, information warfare, as a tactic in international relations. So if you want to ask me a question about these other things afterwards, I'm happy to offer my opinion. But that's not really what I'm interested in tonight. What I'm interested in is this question of whether or not we are facing a new Cold War. So um, after I wrote that study, uh, we convened a, 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 a conference here, an invitation-only conference here, um, brought together about 40 really world-class scholars, technologists, 
uh, uh, regional experts on, the, on Russia. We had um, some media folks involved, some folks from Facebook. And we sat down and we tried to understand, well, what just happened? This was in the summer of 2017. We released this report in October of 2017, literally coincidentally about the same week that all of the social media began to be released where we began to see what were the Russians really doing. The good news is we were right. Um, and so some of the, what we concluded uh, in the chat of the House of Mirrors is that Russia is engaged in a well-financed and determined campaign to undermine democratic political institutions and social institutions in order to free Russia's hand internationally. We also concluded that they're motivated by a resentment, and really we're talking about Vladimir Putin, is motivated by a resentment about the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and is determined to give himself uh, a freer hand by eliminating some of the institutional barriers uh, to, his, uh, to his authority, principally in the form of the European Union and NATO. The principal means that he has at his disposal is political warfare. That's disinformation. That's propaganda. It is um, computational propaganda, which is like propaganda, but use computers to generate it. Um, and there's also this other element, support to fringe, uh, fringe groups in Western societies. So we're going to talk about all of that here in the next 30, 35 minutes, uh, and we'll see where, we'll see where that takes us. So important distinction between Cold War and Cold War, right? And it's not just a, a typographical difference. So um, we probably all are familiar with sort of the Cold War, right? Um, capital C, capital W. This is the stuff of uh, the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, the Czech Uprising of 1968, Solidarity, the Polish Uprising in 1980. This is the stuff of arms races and the Strategic Defense Initiative. This is the stuff of the kitchen debate with, uh, with, with Khrushchev and Nixon. Uh, this is the stuff of the space race in Vietnam, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Afghanistan. Right? That's the Cold War, the historical epic from about 1947 to about 1991. Well, that's the Cold War. But Cold War itself is something different. So you got to remember that the Second World War was the most destructive war the world has ever seen. And it laid waste to the industrial heartland of every industrial society on Earth except the United States of America. So the level of destruction just from conventional warfare was staggering. Then along came Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? And so one bomb could destroy one city. By 1949, the Soviets had the bomb as well. And the implication was that if you wanted to avoid World War III, which was going to produce a lot of these, you had to find a way to confront your adversaries without resorting to conflict, open shooting conflict, hot war, as they might call it. The opposite of hot war is cold war. The use of all the means at a nation's disposal, short of the use of force, to persuade somebody to do something else. That might be economics, it might be political, it might be psychological, right? It could be a whole host of things as long as it doesn't rise to the level of shooting. That's what Cold War meant for the Eisenhower administration and for most of the people who practiced Cold War in the following decades. So this is an important distinction, right? Cold War, the historic epic, versus Cold War, a set of tactics used to, to confront an adversary with all means short of the use of force. And I apologize, my allergies have started, so if you see me gasping for water, that's why. So this isn't just an American view. Oleg Kalugin defected from uh, the Soviet Union in the 1980s, uh, and he confirmed what we all knew, is that the use of propaganda and disinformation and active measures, as they were called uh, at the time, uh, were intended really to sow discord. This is a political weapon intended to produce political effects, right? You want to sow discord. You want to, you want to uh, 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 tear at the cohesion of a society. Uh, you want to weaken the image of the United States in particular, but Western democracy more generally, for audiences around the world. So what the Soviets were trying to do in the Cold War. What the United States tried to do in the Cold War was basically show all of the Soviets' flaws, 
and why the American system, why the Western system, why liberal democracy was better than communism. So one great example comes in 1959. Um, Germany had just joined NATO. Or West Germany had just, had just joined NATO. And the Soviets obviously were not happy about this. Uh, they didn't like the idea that all that German manpower uh, was going to be part of NATO. Uh, so they wanted to make the NATO allies believe that the Germans still couldn't be trusted. So the way they went about doing that was they sent a couple of agents, about three or four, across the border from East Germany into West Germany. And they went to a couple of different uh, old uh, former synagogues. They painted swastikas on them. Now, an interesting thing happened. They did this in three or four places, and those swastikas started popping up all across Germany, across France. One even made it all the way to New York. We don't know who these other people, who these fellow travelers were who did it, but in these three or four German cities, swastikas were painted by Soviet agents, intending to get American and Western allies thinking about, hmm, maybe that denazification wasn't as successful as we thought it was. Can we really trust the Germans? Okay, this is a false flag operation, right? We hear about that in American popular culture pretty, pretty frequently now. This is exactly what this was. It was a false flag operation. So the thing, though, is that this sentiment in German society, the Soviets didn't have to create, right? The issue of denazification and the role of, of, of normal Germans, everyday Germans in the Nazi era, was something that was a lingering, festering sore in Germany at the time. Soviets didn't have to invent that. They just had to exploit that. So let me ask you a question. If you were going to pick a single issue that you wanted to exploit the American public with, the most sensitive raw spot in our national psyche, what issue would you pick? Race? race? Did you say race? Great choice. So this is how the Soviets played on American... Uh, American racial issues through the, um, through, through the 20th century. So this is a little bit of a blurry image, uh, but these gentlemen are known as the Scottsboro Boys. In 1931, nine African-American men were accused of raping two white women on a train in Alabama. After the lynch mob was dispersed and the police took custody of the men, uh, they were tried three times. After the second trial, uh, one of the women conceded that, well, actually, we made the whole story up. It didn't happen. Still, in the third trial, the nine men were uh, convicted and sentenced to lengthy prison terms. Um, this immediately became a cause celeb for the American Communist Party with encouragement from Moscow. So this is 1931. The Soviets had really good propaganda. I hate to say this, but it's true. This is an example, and, and they played this racial issue in, in American life, not just for American and Western audiences, but even for Russian and Soviet audiences. So this is a, a, a Russian propaganda poster, Svoboda par Amerikansky, it's, it's Freedom American Style. So the skyscraper is a, it's a Russian transliteration of Wall Street. You see the police officer with the Statue of Liberty, her mouth chained shut, with, the, uh, with, with, with greed. Uh, this top image here is freedom of speech, um, or excuse me, freedom of the press. And you see the cowboy-hatted uh, journalist sending these ducks out into uh, the night sky. And the, the words on the ducks are lies and slander. So fake news, in other words, right? Uh, the lower left corner, uh, that would be freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of opinion. Uh, and here, uh, a banker or a corporate person is telling the crowds what to think. Freedom of assembly with the police rushing in to break up the crowds. And freedom of identity. The Klan and the lynching. All right, great image of America. But if you want to figure out a way to press America's hot buttons, you play with race, right? So Martin Luther King was targeted by the Soviets for this very reason. The Soviets did not like Martin Luther King because he did not preach radical upsetting of the American system. He talked about making America more true to its founding ideals, to its founding identity. He talked about living up to the ideals in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. He did not preach race war. And the Soviets really wanted a race war. So in the mid-1960s, the Soviets engaged in a campaign in the, the African-American press 
calling Martin Luther King Jr. all sorts of things, including Uncle Tom, a collaborator, a betrayer of, of, of blacks in the United States, until he was assassinated 50 years ago tomorrow. And the moment that he was assassinated, he became a martyr, someone whose death should take people to the streets, rise up in violence, and get that race war that the Soviets were hoping for all along. We know this because when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, a former archivist for the KGB figured out, I gotta get out of here somehow, packed up a ton of his documents and left for London. And so there are a couple of great books that document what the KGB was trying to do, how they were messing in American society, uh, including uh, their attacks on Martin Luther King. So one of my favorite examples of this is uh, in the 1980s, uh, three, this is, this is, in 1983, three Soviet intelligence officers go into a newspaper in India, and they plant a story. And now, India, the subcontinent, other side of the world, right? They plant a story in 1983 that says that the HIV virus that causes AIDS was engineered by an American military uh, lab and it's intended to target members of the homosexual and African-American communities. At one point in the 1980s, 50% of the African-American population had heard the story that the AIDS virus was generated by an American military lab. Okay? Um, by 1987, so four years, four years it takes for that story to be repeated in 30 different languages in 80 different countries. Right? And there's a process that this goes through. It appears in one place, and then it'll get picked up someplace else, referring back to that first place. And there's a cycle that it goes through. Slightly more sophisticated, more respected uh, news outlets pick it up. And even they'll just start reporting back on this weird thing that was reported in India. And I don't know what it is, but we're going to report on it. But four years, 30 languages, 80 countries. Today with Twitter, it happens like that. Right? So, uh, of course, this isn't true, but as late as 2005, there was a survey done by the University of Oregon that said 20% of African Americans believe that the HIV AIDS virus was engineered by humans in an American military lab. These are stories that stick, they are pervasive and pernicious. So, past this prologue. So we have a, uh, an adversary in this case, right? And his name is Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin has a number of different identities. One of the most important uh, touchstones is, this is an image of him as a, as a young KGB officer. KGB is the Foreign Intelligence Service of the former Soviet Union. Uh, young KGB officer, uh, he had described that he had wanted to be a KGB officer since he was a teenager that he had been sort of enamored and romanced by the idea uh, of these intelligence operatives operating in the shadows, changing entire fates of nations uh, where entire armies had maybe failed. Uh, so my fascination with James Bond, uh, Vladimir Putin's fascination with these, with these uh, uh, tales of daring do by KGB officers. On December 5th, 1989, a couple weeks after the Berlin Wall fells, Young officer Putin is in charge of a KGB detachment in Dresden, Germany. And the mob in Dresden had already looted the Stasi uh, headquarters, that's the German secret police headquarters across town. And they made their way to the, the building where the KGB was housed. And it looked like the mob was gonna try to storm the building. And Putin comes out into the night and he tells them, my men inside are armed and they are authorized to use force if you attack the building. So the mob thinks about that, as mobs do, and decides they're gonna go someplace else, right? And Putin spends the rest of the night, by his own description, burning everything they possibly could, every document of any meaning, burning it uh, in, inside this, uh, this KGB uh, office in Dresden, to the point that the boiler actually explodes in the furnace. This becomes a touchstone, though, uh, for, uh, for Putin. This is, this is a, sort of a searing moment where for him, he understands the danger of the mob, the danger of the street, the danger of people 
that are motivated and emotional about politics. So 1991, the Soviet Union ceases to exist. Putin's not sure what to do. He thinks about becoming a taxi driver, decides to stay uh, in the newly reformed uh, intelligence community. By 1998, he's the head of the FSB, which is the successor to the KGB. And by 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, he is the, uh, the interim president and then eventually the president. He serves from 2000 to 2008. Then he becomes prime minister. They changed the constitution so he can be reelected again. And from 2012 to, to, to present, he is Russia's president. But the really, um, the really important thing to remember about that, that night in 1989 is that it changes his perspective on, on, on unruly mobs, right? So whether we're talking about Kiev in 2011 or Kiev in 2000, excuse me, Moscow in 2012, or, or Kiev again in 2013 and 14, we're talking about a man who does not trust mobs, right? This is, this is something that cuts him to the quick. We know this because in 2005 he gave a speech where he called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geostrategic calamity, catastrophe of the 20th century. Think about that for a moment. That's, that's quite a statement, right? The greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. In 2007, he gives a speech at the NATO, at the Munich Security Conference, where he identifies NATO as a threat. Okay, well, that makes sense from a lot of different levels, but we're beginning to see a pattern with this guy. 2013, he issued, he writes an op-ed in the New York Times, where he takes exception to something that President Obama had said, but frankly, it's something that every president has talked about since Bill Clinton in the 1990s. The idea that America is an exceptional nation, right? Putin does not like the idea that the United States is an exceptional nation. He knows Russian history. He knows the long, long history of Russia's role in the world. And what makes the United States exceptional? To Putin, this is something that's offensive. 2014, he gives a speech in Sochi, so now he's president again. And he, we see uh, a rejection of the American-led international system because, he argues, the United States, thinking principally about the Iraq war, has betrayed the international system itself. So the United States unilaterally declares itself the winner of the Cold War, according to Putin. And they don't see any need to reform the system. And instead, they go about flaunting UN resolutions, ignoring the will of the international community, exercising force willy-nilly whenever, wherever they want to. And he characterizes that as a threat to the world. Uh, he also notices, this, this, when I read this, it sort of, it sort of, I sort of giggled to myself a little bit, but he talked about the total control of global mass media, controlled by the West and able to make you know, black, white, and white, black, uh, if, if people so desire. So media manipulation, um, stability of the international system. He also, in 2014, wanted to make sure that people had not yet forgotten about Edward Snowden who by that point is living in Moscow. He's taking sanctuary there. But Edward Snowden, he wants to remind people that the United States is acting as big brother and spying even on their closest allies. Right? He's building a case. He's building an indictment about America's uh, misbehavior in the international community. Um, he talks about uh, uh, the, the America sponsoring Islamic extremist movements. He's talking about the Mujahideen in Afghanistan that the United States most certainly supported in its fight against the Soviet Union. But a point that he's, he pointed out, we have not forgotten this. Interesting. All right, so the bottom line for Putin is that unipolarity, the idea that just the United States is the only international uh, player that matters, is uh, a, a dangerous thing that has inflated American pride. They've manipulated public understanding of what's going on in the world. And the United States is basically the weak, excuse me, the strong suppressing the weak. So, last point from Putin. He also took time to mock the American Electoral College. Now, we all might mock the American Electoral College, but he's asked quite pointedly, what do you mean democracy, right? This is before 2016, 2014. He points out a couple of examples where the American president was not elected by the will of the majority of the people, but by the majority of the Electoral College. He said, that's not, that's not democracy. You can't lecture us about democracies when you have that. So Putin has a couple of different objectives. He wants a free hand for Russia domestically and internationally. 
He wants to eliminate institutions that exclude Russia. So we're talking about NATO, we're talking about the EU. He wants to weaken transatlantic ties because that is a really important dynamic that limits Russians' power, Russia's ability in Europe. He wants to eliminate sanctions, sanctions that are on Russia because they've invaded their neighbors and they've annexed territory, but he wants to eliminate sanctions. He wants to weaken the political cohesion of Russia's primary rivals. So whether we're talking about the United States or we're talking about the Federal Republic of Germany, he wants to weaken the internal political cohesion of those great powers. And ideologically, he favors personal relationships over institutional relationships. So he's less concerned with uh, uh, formal structural relationships between states, but personal relationships, president to president, president to prime minister. So words are cheap. Um, there are lots of examples, and I'm going to probably screw this up here, but there are lots of examples of Russian, uh, uh, Russia moving military hardware around. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen them buzzing American naval ships uh, in the Black Sea and in the Baltic Sea. The Baltic sea. Um, and this is just sort of hot dog. It's dangerous. Uh, one, That's one, how five, accidents two, happen. Knots. We have two Russian SU-24s currently conducting multiple passes at CPAs of 75 feet. Wings are the computer doesn't like track this. And monitor. <laughs> really doesn't like this. Let's go this way. So, no. Five north four nine three. <laughs> all we're going to do is look at this all night. Hold on. So in addition to these sort of... Uh, there we go. So in addition to these sort of uh, 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 reckless, uh, provocative actions at sea, uh, they also invaded um, Crimea. Uh, which is what, which at the point was at the time was uh, part of Ukraine. Uh, this is the first time since the middle of the 20th century that we've talked about annexation. Uh, annexation is a vocabulary word from the 19th century that means one country, the strong guy, takes from the weak guy uh, something that used to be theirs. Uh, so they annexed Crimea, made it part of Russia. They're also providing armor and heavy uh, heavy military equipment uh, to Novorossiya, which is the Russian separatist movement. Uh, in eastern Ukraine. And there's a civil war in Ukraine uh, with ethnic Russians essentially fighting with Moscow's support uh, against the Ukrainian government. In Syria, they've deployed uh, thousands of troops uh, to, to, to prop up the Assad regime. Uh, meanwhile, American forces, particularly American special forces, are running around the desert uh, trying to help the anti-Assad forces, or at least some of them. So that's sort of the background, the context. Let's take a quick look at what Russia is doing today. This handsome man is uh, General uh, Valery Gerasimov. He's the chief of the Russian general staff. And he wrote uh, an interesting uh, but obscure article in a, technical, in a Russian technical journal uh, about eight years ago. And he basically concluded that Russia, because of budget and technological issues, would never be able to match the United States and the West more generally in terms of in a competition around military technology just wasn't going to happen. But Russia could deploy other technologies, including the use of technologies, and this is a quote, for influencing state structures in the population with the help of information networks. Information networks, like social media? So uh, this is known as the, as, as the Gerasimov Doctrine. And it is essentially what in the 1950s, little c, little w, meant Cold War. Going to confront the West on the spectrum of conflict from big theater conventional war up here, nuclear war would be over here, we don't want to talk about that, limited conventional hybrid, which is a blending of these things, irregular terrorism, and then this gray zone, ambiguous. Is it war? Is it open warfare? Is it conflict? Or is it just political competition by means short of the use of force? It's Cold War. It's gray zone conflict. 
So this brings us up to about 2015. Uh, this was a beautiful, well-researched, well-written article uh, in the uh, New York Times Magazine, June 2nd, 2015. Great reporter by the name of Adrian Chen is really interested in this internet research agency that nobody had heard of. And he goes to St. Petersburg and snaps this picture. It's a nondescript office building. But inside, inside, Russia is employing an army of trolls, internet trolls. Folks who are adopting American personas, foreign personas, and pumping information into the information space. So in the Cold War, we used to launch balloons in, in West Germany and hope that they'd come down in the right part of East Germany, talking about the Liberty Bell and freedom. Well, you don't, have to, you don't need balloons. You've got Twitter. You've got Facebook. You've got social media. So Adrian Chen does this great reporting for the New York Times, and he compiles a list of Russian trolls, accounts that he knows are operated out of this institution. And in December of 2015, he reported, you know, I check on this list from time to time, and something weird has happened in recent weeks. They all started acting like Americans, and they're all, treating, they're all tweeting pro-Donald Trump and anti-Hillary Clinton messages. I don't know what's going on, but it sure seems weird. It's like they became, and this is his words, fake conservatives. So interestingly, though, uh, the University of Southern California uh, has gr a great uh, emerging media lab. And they did a study about uh, political activity online. They identified 400,000 bots, so computer accounts uh, that, that look like real human beings on Twitter. 400,000 bots on Twitter between mid-September and mid-October of 2016. They produced, these 400,000 bots, produced 20% of all political content on Twitter in that time frame. And 75% of all those bots were pro-Trump. So we know from the U.S. intelligence community and from the indictments that Robert Mueller has already handed down that Russia did take a hand in the election and that it was intended to influence the election for Donald Trump. Does, uh, does uh, 400,000 Twitter bots mean that that's all that Russia was doing? No. Were all of those bots controlled by Russia? We don't know that either. And in fact, the dirty little secret is that American campaigns on every side of the issue are employing bots, right? This is a way to pump out and amplify information it's not just unique to, to nation states. But there's something going on with social media and big data that sort of flies in the face of everything that we expected just in 2013. You know who this man is? It's Bono, right? So the, nice, the brilliant people at MIT Technology Review have this big article about big data will save politics. And this is the quote. The mobile phone, the net, and the spread of information, a deadly combination for dictators. Whoops. All right. Uh, so what's happened is the complete opposite of this. Let's talk about that. In 2014, uh, Facebook conducted a study with some researchers from Cornell University about what they called mass scale emotional contagion, which sounds lovely. But what it is is that it, one person can change the entire mood in a room if they are emotive enough, okay? So the question was, can you have emotional contagion through social media? Facebook wanted to know this because guess what? This is the secret of their business model, right? They want to know, are you reactive to this? Or are you reactive to that? Because that's how they're gonna build a psychographic profile of you and sell that to the advertiser who knows that you really like puppies. So in their next Tide commercial, you better have some puppies to target this audience member. But that psychographic profiling is based on this kind of research. So Cornell University scientists are interested in it because they're interested in the, the broader, deeper psychological science behind it. But Facebook is interested in it because, well, it's good for business. Um, I'll tweet the link to this study. It's a, it's a, it's a relatively short study, but it's, but it's interesting. Um, this, this, is, this is the stuff of Cambridge Analytica. This is the stuff of micro-targeting. Uh, this is stuff that businesses from the biggest to the smallest corporations are, are applying this kind of technology uh, to how you target audiences for advertising, right? This is not, this is, there's no secret here. This is not classified information. This is how business works online. If you have a Facebook account, if you've got a Twitter account, if you've got an Amazon Echo, 
All of that data is being gathered and sliced and diced and they're putting together profiles based on what you re respond to. So Facebook made us not just like things, they like, we can, we can like it, we can love it, it can make us laugh, it can make us cry, it can make us angry. Well now they got five more levels of specificity of what your emotional response is to everything. All right? So, how did Russia use all this data? Well, Russia was interested in, again, exploiting that weak spot in America's national psyche. So they created accounts like Blacktivist. Blacktivist had 300 followers on Facebook. Excuse me, 300,000. 300,000 followers on, on Facebook. And he purported to be somebody, an, an activist, a black activist, who was concerned about police brutality against African American men. And so he posted, he got in the habit, he would post videos of police brutality, right? Cops beating up African American men. Uh, he, on Twitter, he had uh, some choice things to say too. Um, you know, and the thing is that that's not a horribly unreasonable statement, right? But we're just going to pick at that scab until it bleeds. Uh, and he, he was discovered when he tried to organize an event around uh, the Freddie Gray uh, 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 killing anniversary in Baltimore. And somebody close to the, uh, the Freddie Gray family contacted him and said, well, who are you? And um, he, couldn't, he didn't have a really good answer. And then he accidentally, a, a data science researcher in Virginia, actually figured out that he was Russian because he, in one of his uh, posts, he left his geotagging on, and it was St. Petersburg, Russia. So, uh, but this is, this is the kind of thing that they were doing. They were, they were organizing events, and in a number of cases, we know that they organized counter-protests on opposite sides of the same street to get Americans standing on street corners yelling at the losers on the other side because they're trying to turn us against each other. One of the uh, more, I mean, Pokemon Go. So this was a, this was a, a, a Tumblr page uh, that created a Pokemon Go competition. So the idea was that you would go to the places where police officers had killed African American men. You would bring up your Pokemon Go on your phone. You would capture the Pokemon that was there, take a picture of that on your phone, and then if you collected all six or seven of them, you would send it to this email address: stoppolicebrutalityds at gmail.com. You can tell it's a quality email account. Uh, you'd send the pictures there, and if you got all six, they'd send you a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Silly, stupid, but it's a way of, it's basically, it's a, it's a cheap effort. It's a kitchen sink approach. Throw everything up against the wall and see what sticks. Um, there's some more Facebook ads I thought we could look at very quickly. This is uh, the LGBT United, supposed, now these are all Russian accounts. LGBT United, uh, this is Bernie Sanders, supposed to be Bernie Sanders. Um, and the, basically, the entire purpose of the ad is to emphasize division between Democrats. Um, uh, there's more text that, 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 that I didn't click through, but um, basically saying that uh, it's, this is all silly. Uh, Bernie wouldn't want it that way. Hillary's a loser. Let's go. Um, there's another one here uh, from LGBT United about Westboro Baptist Church, which is really one of the more offensive organizations uh, operating in the United States today. Uh, but it's, it's the fact that you're, 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 frankly, giving them an echo to the work that they're doing already by talking about them on social media. Um, this was from the group called Heart of Texas. They targeted citizens of Texas with an interest in either independence or patriotism, and they were trying to stoke division, uh, uh, around, uh, particularly around the immigration issues. Right? Um, this is something that we're going to see again and again and again. Interesting, in October, October 26th, of 2016, uh, somebody spent 2,300 rubles, rubles, uh, for the heart of Texas, for a, an event called Get Ready to Secede. Because remember, Hillary was gonna win. And the idea then was that the Texas secessionists needed to spring into action because they didn't wanna live under Hillary Rotten Clinton. So there's some really wicked forces at play in all of this. Um, this is a, a, a rally last May, so 11 months ago, uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. That's the statue of Robert E. Lee that has been the central point of a lot of controversy uh, in the city for uh, much of the last couple of years. 
Uh, and these are a group of, uh, of, of white supremacists who have brought their tiki torches to protest, um, to protest the plans to remove the statue. Now, what's interesting, not so much the tiki torches, uh, but the fact that they, um, they've spent the night chanting, Russia is our friend. Not making this up. Um, we saw what happened in Charlottesville later in the summer, but a smaller group came back to the statue, which you can see is now wrapped in plastic, uh, last October. And they spent the night chanting, the South will rise again, Russia is our friend, we will be back. Russia is our friend? What does that have to do with Robert E. Lee and the Civil War and Confederate heritage? I, that, that was, I was sitting there scratching my head, I couldn't figure that out. Well, there's some really smart people who have been looking at this issue, and a guy by the name of Casey Michelle has done some of the best work on it. Casey has identified what is essentially a nationalist international that resonates with the rhetoric of Vladimir Putin. That Putin essentially has emerged as the last great white defender of Christendom. And he's also supporting separatist movements. So for the last couple of summers in St. Petersburg, if you are a leader of a separatist movement from California, from Texas, from Catalonia, where they just had a referendum, from Scotland, you're invited on an all expense paid trip to the beautiful St. Petersburg where you can share tips and points and hear from some people. That's, that's, that's sort of interesting, but it gets to this idea of undermining American political cohesion if you've got people who are uh, 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 separatists wanting to break up the union that Lincoln fought to save by bringing them. So this is um, another ad right before the election um, about liberals trying to attack Texas. What's really interesting there is that it, at that point, 61%, I want to get that number right, 61% of, of Trump supporters in a Texas survey in August of 2016 favored succession if Hillary Clinton won. So our politics have reached a point where if, you're, if, you, if, you're, if your favorite candidate loses, the, the solution is to secede. That's really dangerous for American democracy. So this is the yescalifornia.org, which is the California independence or secessionist movement. Um, you know, they've got not that many followers on Twitter, but California has a ballot question provision in its constitution. You can put any question on the ballot if you get enough signatures. The interesting thing about Yes California is that its leader, this nice man, Lawrence Marinelli, launched the last Yes California campaign from his home just outside of Moscow. Uh, he's got a lovely Russian wife. Um, uh, they actually, the effort stalled last year and they withdrew last year's petitions. They're starting again because he realized that living in Moscow was a problem. So he's moved back to California. He's going to give it another go. Um, so we'll see. His, his goal this time is to have a, the ballot, it'd be a July, July? July 2021 ballot question in California. So stay tuned for that. Um, but these ties between white extremists and, uh, and, and separatists uh, in Russia are, are pretty lengthy. So the, the guy leading the chance of Russia is our friend in Charlottesville on those two occasions is this guy, Richard Spencer. He's the leader of the alt-right. Uh, he uh, has more audience than he should probably uh, get. But his wife is this woman, uh, whose name I don't want to screw up here, so let me just get that, Nina, Nina Kuprianova. Nina Kuprianova is uh, born in Russia. Where they met, I don't know exactly know. And I should note that they're separated now. But Nina Kuprianova works uh, under the pen name of Nina Byzantina. And as Nina Byzantina, she translates the work of this gentleman. His name is Alexander Dugin. Alexander Dugin is a Russian political philosopher, uh, a fascist. He believes that um, we need to have another major war to usher in the end times and he's all about creating the conditions that are ripe for that war to happen. Um, he's written a book, The American Empire Should Be Destroyed. Uh, he's got strange connections to a lot of right-wing groups in the United States. What this is all about, in my opinion, is undermining faith in American democracy. So we know that in 2016, Russia hacked into 21 different states' voter, voter rolls. 
Uh, we don't believe that they changed any data. We don't believe they changed any, any voters. Uh, and, they, and we don't have any evidence that they actually changed votes. Important detail. Uh, but why would you be messing around with voter rolls? Unless you want to get people to begin doubting the integrity of the entire electoral system. Uh, and what's interesting is that this corresponds with a generational collapse in the perceived benefits of democracy. So this is a survey uh, uh, by uh, Yasha Monk and Roberto Stefan Foa uh, that looks at people who say that it's essential to live in a democracy across a variety of different Western states. And the more recent you were born, the less, the less likely you are to say that living under a democracy is essential. And increasingly popular are living under military rule, living under a variety of different authoritarian models. Um, that's, that's, that's kind of alarming. But it's part of a populist, uh, a populist wave that is sweeping the world. Uh, so there are populist parties in France, Marine Le Pen, the Front National, the National Front, uh, who, by the way, got $30 million in her last campaign from a bank close to Putin, a Russian bank close to Putin. Uh, in uh, Greece, the party Syriza, when they became the ruling party in Greece, it set off alarm bells all over Europe because of their close ties to Russia. In uh, Italy, the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement was not actually pro-Russia until 2015 when they began talking about the United States dragging Europe on this anti-Russia crusade. They also started spreading uh, Russian disinformation and conspiracy theories through their own social networks and through their own websites and their own news accounts. Um, and it was often uh, 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 echoed by uh, Russian media as well. Uh, in Hungary, you've got Viktor Orban, uh, who is a, a true autocrat in the, in the making uh, and who is very close to Putin uh, and who Putin uh, uh, has a very favorable relationship with. And then finally, in Austria, uh, the, the Freedom Party there has actually signed a, a cooperative agreement with Vladimir Putin's party. So these connections between populist movements that tend to be anti-NATO, anti-EU, anti-immigrant in Russia are pervasive. Right? This is the thing that, are all, that ties all of these things together, is that they are anti-immigrant, anti-EU, and anti-NATO. Right? So you got two of the three there that are part of, uh, part of Putin's grand political strategy. So other examples of Russian influence campaigns, the Scottish independence vote, Brexit, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that what we saw happen in 2016 got some test runs in those campaigns. Uh, US elections of 2016 we know, the French election of 2017, the French actually pulled down 300,000 French uh, Facebook accounts. Uh, the German election of 2017 and the Catalonia independence vote of 2017. Um, so what's it all mean? Well, uh, Putin, as we said up front, he wanted his uh, free hand for Russia domestically and internationally, eliminate institutions that exclude Russia, including NATO and the EU, weaken transatlantic ties, eliminate sanctions, and weaken the political cohesion of, uh, of, of its adversaries. So what have we got? Well, Brexit succeeded. The UK is leaving the EU. It's going to happen, right? Uh, we don't know what that's going to mean long term for the EU, but institutionally, it's certainly a change from what happened before. In the United States, I'm left to conclude, quite frankly, that I believe that Vladimir Putin would like to see the United States broke up just the way the Soviet Union broke up in 1991 at the hands of a successful American Cold War. It's a stark thought, but I think that the evidence certainly points to, at minimum, trying to so confuse us and tie us down and make us hate each other so much that we cease functioning as an effective polity. Maximally, I think he'd like to see us break up. So the implications are that um, the ambitions that we're talking about here from Russia are much greater than uh, just uh, electing an American president. Uh, they want to essentially free themselves domestically and internationally and eliminate the rivals to that. With a very small financial investment, Russia has used our own freedoms and our own technologies to really turn us against one another. Right? I have stopped talking about politics on Facebook because it just ain't worth it. Right? Um, he's succeeded in getting people to question uh, the integrity of American democracy. 
and he's pitted Americans against Americans over div divisive social issues, all with the end result of diminishing the appeal of Western liberalism. Now, the thing is, this last piece here, Western liberalism, most of the good that we think about in the world in the last mm, 300 years is a result of Western liberalism, right? All the progress, the commitment to science, uh, equality, that all comes from that part of the, of, of, of the West. We have not engaged that in any sort of effective manner as a counter to the rise of populism across Europe or even here in the United States. So is it a Cold War? I don't know if it's going to be another historic epic, but it sure as heck is another Cold War with these tactics that are being used to affect political outcomes short of the use of force. I've gone much longer than I wanted to. I wanted to take two minutes to maybe talk, though, about how can you spot a Russian troll online. Um, there's a great website, and we're going to tweet this out, too, uh, here at the end of the night, if you're interested, uh, Pel, uh, at Pell Center or at JM Lutus, uh, how to track Russian trolls. There are a couple key things. Um, there's some linguistic cues, right? So broken English, especially the misuse of definitive article of the or an. So in the example that you see here, uh, I, uh, I don't want my children to walk on streets. So on these streets, right? Uh, with, with the sign like this. The misuse of the, of the article, the, is a good indication that they're not a native English speaker and probably not really an American. Uh, if they have trouble posing questions, in Russian, you don't actually change the word order, um, unlike in English. So you get silly contraptions like this, Grandma, why marijuana is illegal. It's a good indication not a native English speaker, probably Russian if, they, if it's still in that order. Um, and then finally, if you go back through the history of what somebody's been tweeting and you take a look at what else they're tweeting, uh, you can get a good sense of whether or not where they stand on big issues. If they have, uh, uh, at a couple of different key points in time, if they, were treating, if they were tweeting about the shoot down of the Malaysian airline jet over Ukraine and defending Russia, probably a good sign that they're a troll. If they, are, uh, if they tweeted about the Crimea invasion and justified it on uh, Russia's behalf, probably a good bet that they're a troll. If they do all of these types of things, it's probably a good bet that they're a troll. It's not a single uh, definitive uh, trigger that you can look for, but rather sort of a clinical diagnosis based on their behavior online. So, you know, finally, and this is really it, um, I talked to my students uh, at the beginning of the semester about how do you assess what a good source is, right? And um, there are three questions you can ask yourself. This is about sort of writing a paper, right? How, how do you know if a source is good? You can extrapolate this and think about this in social media, too. So is the argument valid? Is the thing that this person claiming sort of within the realm of the reasonable? If it is, then maybe it's, maybe it's legit. And if it's not, well, then you should be a little bit suspicious. Who is the intended audience? Are they speaking to a very specific narrow band of people? Are they trying to trigger people? What are they, what, what, who, are they, who are they really trying to speak to? And is the author authoritative? Is it, if it's some random scrabble of letters and numbers that make up a Twitter account, and you have no idea who this person is, you maybe don't tweet or like or retweet that one. Because at the end of the day, we all need to be our own, uh, editors isn't the right word, but we all need to be mindful of our own responsibilities as purveyors and consumers of information, but especially purveyors of information. So this is what we can do. Uh, the, the bottom line for me is that uh, there's an effort underway, a well-financed and coordinated foreign effort to pit American against American. That's Cold War. I'd be happy to take your questions. <laughs> Microphone right behind you. Right here. Teresa? Hi, do you think the anti muller uh, activity is funded and supported by our friends? So, so it's, it's hard to say, because you look, you can, you can be, um, anti muller just because you, you, you're suspicious of the FBI. Um, I, would, uh, I, t I find myself increasingly skeptical of most things that I see that are hyper-partisan. Although the first thing, I mean hyper-partisan on both sides, right? So um, I didn't include this, but there's this wonderful website called Hamilton 68 that tracks about 600 known Russian bots. And you, they sort of have these the real-time dashboard where you can see 
how, how, you know, what Russia's tweeting on, uh, and what issues they're trying to amplify. So when we got all wrapped around the axle about whether or not football players should take a knee or stand for the flag, the two leading hashtags on the 600 accounts, number one was stand for the flag, number two was take a knee. Uh, so playing both sides of the issue around a divisive issue, uh, hyper-partisan on both sides, so you can't say. I think that it's 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 reasonable to expect. And if you look at if you watch Hamilton '68, you'll see that there have definitely been references to Robert Mueller in there, uh, principally attacking his credibility and attacking the, the credibility of the FBI. Part of what Russia would like us to do is, to, as Americans, doubt the integrity of our domestic institutions. Uh, do you know? Does Does Putin have? Does Putin have any allies that are pursuing, along with him, the same objectives and goals relative to the dividing the United States? Well, I th so you're talking about in terms of like uh, political allies, yes. other countries. Right. Um, you know, I, honestly, I think that there is a, 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 a we're at a moment, um, and we can trace this back to the end of the Cold War, where America's dominance in the international system has been waning. Across, gener across the last 20, 25 years. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's not just because of the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, it's not just because of the fecklessness of Barack Obama, as John McCain might have characterized it. Uh, it there, is a, a, there, there is a long historical pattern that's playing out here. I mentioned that at the end of World War II, the United States was the only industrial economy left on planet Earth, right? So we came out of that war like this, the rest of the world was down here. And the rest of the world has come back. And there was no place in terms of relative power for us to go but down, right? That's not a reflection of the relative merit or the integrity of American uh, beneficence in the world. It's just the reality that the rest of the world has recovered from that utter destruction in 1945. So there's uh, a lot of forces that are uh, at play that are pulling people away from the American-led uh, world. The other thing that is not part of this conversation at all, but there's just been a fundamental shift in economic power, right? So where the, 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 the global wealth used to be, even 20 years ago, was centered about over Greenland. Now it's shifting back to the east and closer to China, uh, and that's just a reality. And dollars, whether it's uh, American dollars or it's, uh, or, or it's uh, uh, Chinese yen, uh, attracts uh, affinity, attracts interest, attracts relationships. So I don't know if there's anybody explicitly working to disrupt the international system that he, the way he is, but he certainly has allies uh, who generally favor a more Russian perspective. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you think the United States is carrying on the same kind of a uh, Cold War in Russia? Are we play, are, is, yeah, are we giving as good as we got? So this is, and this is an interesting question. Um, so what's missing right now uh, is uh, is an American counter, right? That we're that that, that we're that we're aware of. Um, we know that uh, the uh, uh, this the Russia in the last four or five years has passed a number of laws to kick to kick American NGOs out, uh, out of suspicion that these NGOs were essentially fomenting trouble, that they were causing people to to question the authority of of the Kremlin uh, and the Putin regime. Um, or they? They're groups like IRI and NDI. They work in election and civic society building exercises all over the world. Uh, the question is, if you are uh, a, an authoritarian, uh, you don't like anybody who's uh, emphasizing the rule of law and emphasizing the, um, uh, the value of free and fair elections. Um, so uh, are we purposely trying to topple uh, Putin? I don't know. I don't think so. I particularly don't think so today. I also know that um, a year ago, Congress put uh, $40 million uh, into an appropriations bill to fund a global engagement center, uh, in particular to get them to counter Russian propaganda. And so far, not a dollar of that has been spent. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, so, 
in, in the Putin interview with Megyn Kelly, he's, he claimed, and he's claimed a lot of other places too, that the United States has interfered in Russia's elections. In particular, the 2012 election that he won most recently to become president. Uh, because he, uh, you might remember that there were actually disturbances in the street leading up to that, uh, up to that time, and then after the fact too. This is this is the era of Pussy Riot and uh, and the uh, murder of Boris Nemtsov. All right, so there's there's a there's a whole host of things happening extrajudicially inside Russia at that time. He maintains that those street protests were provoked by Americans, right? By the Carnegie Endowments, uh, not the Carnegie Endowment, but by the Carnegie Moscow Center was uh, with the, at the fulcrum of that, he argued. Um, whether or not that's true, I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, I'm a lot skeptical. Uh, but that's certainly what he claims. Well, that's the thing, is that he right. just says, you do this. Mm -hmm. All of this works because we are, as the title of our report suggested, we're living in a house of mirrors. And what we're looking at, we can't be 100% sure is right. I think that uh, my mom has asked a question via Facebook. Is that, well, is we that? do have a question via <laughs> Facebook, but it's not your mom. OK, all right. Hi, mom. <laughs> do you believe that there are still influential social media users, like blacktivists, that will eventually be outed as trolls Perhaps some that will never be discovered. Um, yes, to both of those. And 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 and, and you know, look, um, I, I have had a, uh, I, I, I've got uh, so Eisenhower's uh, chief advisor on political warfare was a guy by the name of C. D. Jackson. C. D. Jackson had been the publisher of of of, uh, of uh, Time magazine. Uh, was a, Eisenhower's chief wartime propaganda advisor. Uh, in Europe, and went to, with him to the White House. He's brilliant. So I've got my own ghosted Twitter account called C.D. Jackson's Ghost. Uh, this is really easy to do. If I want to tweet something a little bit more edgy than I would uh, with uh, Sylvia Regina in my name, C.D. Jackson tweets that. Um, and it's, it's just, that's really easy to do. So are there going to be others that are out there now? My, now my cover is blown because we just broadcasted it to Facebook. <laughs> But you get the idea. This is easy to do. Anybody can do it. And so my guess is that, yeah, there are people that we're going to never know uh, their true provenance and their true intentions. But you can take a look at what they're doing. You can make some informed, educated decisions. Uh, yes. You mentioned that Russia is like, supporting groups that are like seceding from their own nations that aren't in the United States. And you also mentioned that uh, Texas and California are both having movements like whether they be by bots or by actual people yeah. that are talking about seceding themselves. Mm -hmm. So I actually have two questions, they, but they're both related to that idea. The first one is, what does Russia stand to gain immediately in this Cold War with, like, Catalonia were to separate from Spain, and that doesn't really, like, have a direct impact on America? Mm -hmm. And then also, if Californians or Texans were to take those, the secession seriously, mm -hmm. what are the immediate effects that we would see in America? Well, so um, so for uh, for Catalonia, you know th what the what this does is that it sort of sticks another um, wrinkle into the internal politics of an important European state, Spain. You know, the, the the idea is that you don't necessarily have to achieve a specific positive outcome. You just have to create enough chaos and enough mess that it ties people down. That you spend time talking about um, what's going on in Catalonia rather than. Uh, the Russian heavy armor that's now operating in eastern Ukraine. Uh, so some of it's distraction, some of it is uh, just helping fray the fabric of the European Union. Uh, in the case of what would happen if Texas in, and or California were to secede, you know, what's interesting there is that, you know, uh, the, whoever was running this out of St. Petersburg had a pretty thoughtful strategy, right? If Clinton wins, if Clinton wins, uh, we're going to have the, the Texas secessionists start making noise. But if Trump wins, conservative Texas, Clinton, we're out. But if Trump wins, we're going to get these California secessionists ginned up, right? Because now, either way, win or lose, Russia wins. Um, the, what, what should we look for if, if that happens? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a, um, uh, there's, 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 I, I don't think it's likely is, 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 is my bottom line on that. Um, but I don't like the idea of a, of, a, of a foreign power, a hostile foreign power, 
messing around and with our with our political cohesion. I just find that offensive on a lot of different levels. Um, you know, uh, th there's 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 questions about whether or not um, states actually have the right to secede. Texas, because it was an independent nation before it seceded, it appears to California does not. But there is interesting a Zogby poll uh, last Labor Day weekend, uh, which asked Americans, well, what do you think? Do states have the right to secede? And 29%, uh, if I'm remembering right, uh, said no. Another 26% said, uh, I don't know. 39% said yes, states have the right to secede. Um, I think that's, we're playing with some dangerous forces here uh, that would change the American economy, uh, change our position in the world, and, 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 and the sorting out of that would just be distracting enough for us on the international scene that would give states like China and Russia an opportunity to do whatever they're going to do next. So we'll go right up here. Let's start, we'll start in the back and come down. So it seems like this topic is becoming more and more popular about Russia interfering in our politics. Um, what do you think is a good step for us as a society to take to, to avoid these influences? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so the, my, my first advice is uh, to uh, um, assume benign intent with your fellow Americans. When you're talking to somebody about an issue and you disagree on the politics of it, don't take this as a mortal betrayal of everything that's sweet and pure in the world, right? Uh, it's politics. We're going to disagree about stuff, and you might think one thing and I might think another, but at the end of the day, we're still Americans, and we'll figure it out together. And, and the beautiful thing about politics is that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to get us to reconcile the greatest number of people to the common good. It doesn't mean we're all going to agree all the time. And so part of what I get frustrated about is this idea that politics is a dirty word. No, politics is good. Politics is how we resolve these big, hard questions without killing each other. We had a civil war in this country because we took race and slavery out of the national conversation. The Compromise of 1850 said American electoral politics will no longer settle the issues of race and slavery. We end up fighting this huge civil war over it. Politics is not the problem. But we've got to remember that we're all Americans and we're in this together. That's, that's my soapbox moment for the night. <laughs> <laughs> Another one here. outing of Facebook and the algorithms that they're using, people will be a little more skeptical about what they're reading on the right and mm -hmm. on the left. Yeah. So, so the question, if you didn't hear, was will people be more skeptical about what they're seeing in social media, Facebook in particular, uh, whether it's the right or the left based on what we now know? Um, I'd like to think so. I don't really buy it. Uh, the, I think that there, for, for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of us, um, this is noise, uh, and we're going to go back to the, you know, what, what, this all, all, what all of this preys on is confirmation bias, right? So they know because of what you've liked on Facebook or what you've tweeted or retweeted, they know that you are a pro-gun, anti-immigrant believer, and they're going to target you with news and messages that are specifically on that issue. Or they know that you are a big supporter of abortion rights and gay rights. And so they're going to target you with you on that. And we all like to see ourselves proved right, right? So like, man, when we put our study out and it was then confirmed literally three days later by the stuff that, was, that came out of Facebook, we loved it because we were right. We all love that feeling. We all want to be right. And so we look for that confirmation bias in a lot of what we do, both online and the way we consume our news. And what we have to do, to, to, to the earlier question, if we can get ourselves out of the habit of just relying on one ideological perspective for news, right, and actually try to expose ourselves, as painful as it might be sometimes, to a broad diversity of opinion, it's probably good for the republic. Whether or not it's good for our blood pressure is a separate question. <laughs> Sir. Just, um, I'm pretty locked down on Facebook, but many people don't know that you can go into your privacy settings and you can click on following me, and you can find people who are following you. And I clean that out about every three weeks, and there is not one American name yeah. in there. And I'm being, and I'm not, 
these are people these are people you don't follow yeah they're slavic names and i probably cleaned 30 to 40 out yeah out. yeah i so so um you, you're not doing any harm by by eliminating those people but i actually think because i saw this article literally two weeks ago and i thought man are these people following me because i'm a little paranoid and they were it turns out this is a flaw in the in the in the Facebook. It's something that Facebook hasn't fixed. It's a glitch in their system. They're not really following you. Is is the moral of the story? But you have to go into like a search thing to see who's following you. And yeah, and it, it's it, yeah. So if you go home and you look at Snopes on this, and they actually explain that it's not it's nothing nefarious. So you rest assured. I can put a little a little piece tonight. Yeah, right here, ma'am. The information and the examples you've given us tonight, why isn't that in our own uh, media every day, yeah. explaining what's going on that's, so that's, that we can't be um, bamboozled? Well, there is so much. I, so, I, you know, part of my job is to pay attention to what's going on in the world. I need a nap, right? It, it is so much every day, day after day, that it's just really hard for this kind of stuff to break through. My one of our recommendations and one of my real laments with the Mueller investigation is that I think that we are so focused on whether or not there was any criminal involvement with the Trump team and Russia that it completely ignores the fact that there was a sophisticated and successful political warfare attack on American democracy. If there was no crime committed in that, we're never going to know about it, right? So yeah, the U.S. intelligence community has set, community has said it. And the House and Senate uh, Intel committees are investigating it. But what we really need is an independent commission uh, with some uh, uh, men and women on both sides who are beyond rep political reproach, who can make the case to the entire American public and lay bare for us all, not just me here standing on the stage at Salve, but lay bare for the American public what really just happened. Because guess what? James Comey said last summer, the Russians are coming back. I'm here to tell you they never left. All right? They will be active on social media in the 2018 cycle and the 2020 cycle. Bank it. Bank on it. Yeah. This gentleman's been waiting very patiently with the question. Yeah, that's uh, tactics aside, I was just curious in your original slide, early slide, you mentioned uh, motivation of Putin and yeah. resentment for the... 1991. The yeah. Aren't there more pragmatic? Well, certainly he is, yeah, so I didn't talk about, <sighs> you see how long I went already. Um, there's a, um, he's, he is really susceptible to financial pressures. Um, but there are some accounts that Putin is actually the richest man on earth, right, that he has, uh, that he has made himself wealthy as president of Russia. Um, and a lot of that money is not in Russian banks, it's in banks in the West. Uh, and so one of the challenges for the intelligence community, particularly the financial intelligence guys and gals is to figure out where that money is and if you were really serious if you really wanted to go at Putin personally you'd lock down that money and uh, that would have a, I think a, a very quick deterrent effect but that's not something that, we, that, that anybody in the West has appeared uh, interested to do and part of that has to do with some of the, the, the financial interweavings of, of, of the West with Russian oligarchs so there have been something like 16 Russians murdered in the UK in the last five, six, seven years, right? Um, why hasn't that been a bigger scandal in the UK? Because there's so much Russian oligarch money in London that they don't want to scare it away. Listen, if you don't get to the root of the motivation, the tactics are yeah. interesting, but yeah. it's not actionable. It's yeah. really what's motivating the behavior that's yeah. addressed. And, and, and in this case, I think it's power and I think it's money. I know you don't probably want to talk about this, but I have to ask the question. If you say that Putin is to try to create chaos, mm -hmm. disruption, um, you know, where we're all off track with distractions, we see that happening in our own system today. And I'm just curious, we've never seen this in my lifetime, and why? Can you give us some perception there? Why, why, why what? Why, why, is, why are things so squirrely today? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's Russia. I feel like 
Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I, so the adoption of techniques. So, so, so. We have a president who uh, who fosters the sense of chaos, right? So he knows that he can dispatch a tweet and um, sort of obscure a whole host of issues. And part of that's a reflection, a criticism, frankly, of uh, of American media, which which reports on the 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 easy as opposed to the hard. So one of the reasons why we're not talking about this on the nightly news, some outlets are, but some are not, um, is because it's hard and it's complicated. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta spend a lot of time sort of digging through some of the stuff. Um, one of the things that we're going to tweet when I'm done here is the an archive of 200,000 Russian tweets uh, that went out in 2016 uh, that are available for archive. You can scroll through them at your own leisure. But I, I think that one of the reasons that it feels so chaotic right now is because it is so chaotic, and part of that's the media environment. But I think a big part of it is that we have a president who um, likes stirring the pot and then taking advantage of that chaos for whether it's a political agenda or a personal agenda. Um, you know, I think these are unprecedented times. Yeah. Sir, and then, and then I want to be, we got one more online? OK. If Donald Trump were not the Republican candidate yeah. in 2016, do you think the Russians would have gotten involved in this? So what we don't know is did, so we know that Putin had some, some sort of personal uh, animosity towards Hillary Clinton, going back to the 2012 election where he feels like it was she as Secretary of State who directed people into the streets uh, to oppose his election in 2012. That personal animosity, I think, was a huge factor. Um, but I think in Putin, I, say, I don't, I don't, it's very easy to get sucked into the rabbit's den of, of conspiracy theories and, well, did he do this and did he, that, he do that? I don't know. I don't know, but I do believe that there is enough stuff that predates 2016 across all of Europe that suggests that Putin has cultivated these populist, anti-immigrant, nationalist movements uh, as a means of essentially disrupting Western liberalism to give Russia a freer hand. Uh, so now whether or not Trump was a happy coincidence for Putin or there's some sort of nefarious conspiracy there, I'm not ready to, to, to pass judgment on that. So, okay. Here's our Facebook question: Is there evidence to suggest to Ru to suggest to Russia has also been trying to infiltrate and influence specific religious movements? We get an extra two in that. Yeah. Infiltrate. Well, so there's 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 clearly an affinity um, uh, between some in the evangelical community. Uh, and this, this idea of Russia as the defender of white European Christendom. That, that, that there's, there are definitely some pockets like that. Um, infiltrate is a word that means to me that you're, you're, you're dispatching agents to, to, to get in there and to try to steer these groups. I, don't, I, I have not seen any reporting on that. I don't know. I don't have anything to support or, or refute that idea. So I could answer questions all night, but I want to be respectful of folks' time. We can wrap it up now, and I'd be happy to stay after, or if you want to. Uh, so we'll get two more questions, and we'll call it a night. And if you need to go, I understand. Someone over there uh, mentioned the news, uh, the night, nightly news, and I don't think they do try to explain anything to us. So given the many issues, divisive issues, how do you think we should educate ourselves um, to specific issues and events and knowing yeah. what's going on and how to think about them rather than just really listening to a lot of opinions, yeah. uh, a lot of very loud opinions. Well, you know, whether or not you agree with everything that I said here tonight, I would hope that it would give you a reason to sort of think about the way you're consuming information and the way you're uh, interacting with, with, with what you see online. Uh, but I also hope that you'll talk to your friends, your neighbors, your families, uh, not to persuade anybody, but just to get people thinking a little critically. I mean, fundamentally, what we're, what's being exploited here is the fact that as a society, we don't think critically, right? We are sheep, and whatever the nightly news tells us is happening, that's it. And so we need to be uh, more informed, we need to be um, more skeptical, uh, and we need to be, um, uh, I think, a little bit more accommodating of differences of opinion. 
Well, that's, you know, you're going to get me up on another soapbox here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the question of um, how are we messing with their society mm -hmm. in retaliation? I find it hard to believe that we aren't doing a lot of the things that they're doing, that our agencies are not involved, and yet I read that same statistic that you said, the $40 million in the State Department and not a penny, <clears throat> not a penny used. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are we doing? And Well, so if you're talking about uh, changing, if you're talking about changing governments, right, that's not something that the CIA decides to do on its own, right? That is a big, this is one of the reasons that the U.S. intelligence community is so convinced that Putin had to be personally involved in, uh, in, in the 2016 operation here in this country is because it's the kind of thing that in history people have gone to war over, right? So those kinds of stakes, that decision is not going to be made by some deputy dog and some agency who says, hey, I got to be in my bonnet, let's go do this. This is a, this is a, a, a serious governmental decision. I don't believe that um, the, the, the body of evidence of the way this administration has handled Russia since the inauguration leads me to be highly skeptical that we're doing anything aggressive towards Russia internally. Now, we just, dis we just ejected 60 diplomats with the caveat that we didn't eliminate the billets, right? So the 60 people in those billets have to go back to Russia, but they can send another 60 to fill those spots. Right? So there is a tough talk and a lot of rhetoric around some things, but there has been a kid's glove approach to Russia that would make me very skeptical of the idea that we're doing anything to, to change the Putin regime. And, and, and the, the, you know, the question of regime change, as we know from our last 15 years, is a really complicated thing. So, so an agency director would not be able to do I don't believe so. I, I, if we're talking about uh, if we're talking about a sustained information warfare campaign against any state, but against the largest nuclear armed nation on the planet, that's not a decision that's made by an agency director or a deputy. That it would have to be made, in my opinion, at, at the presidential level. Folks, I want to thank you for your time for the conversation.